Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where I am coming off of a truly magical night at the Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice premiere, where I was a guest uh, of my friends at Dolby, who actually uh, outfitted Radio City Music Hall with all the necessary technology to play the movie uh, at the level of quality that Zack Snyder and Warner Brothers were looking for. We'll be discussing that quite a bit uh, in my reviews, uh, and I'm, again, so grateful to Dolby for taking me uh, to the premiere. And I think what's so great about it is that I was able to uh, share the night with a lot of you. I hit 20,000 followers on Twitter, so thank you so much for that. And I'm just so excited for you guys to see the movie, because I think there's a magical night in store for you uh, when you do see Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Now, the viewer question today is actually going to go first because I got asked this quite a lot yesterday, and that's when can I post my uh, review of the movie, you know, just even in general my reaction. And the answer is there's an embargo uh, in place from Warner Brothers that means you can't discuss the movie or post any reviews until tomorrow night, Tuesday, uh, March 22nd at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So uh, that's when my review will go up. Uh, now, I have a little something to hold you over, and that is the gift that they gave us at uh, the premiere. So I haven't opened it, and I thought I would open it with you. All right, so this was in an everyone's seat, and it was super awesome just to be there with like 6,000 people watching uh, a movie I can't say anything about. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so here we go. What could it be? It's in this beautiful box. All right. Oh, it opens this way. Oh, Turkish Airlines. Thank you, Turkish Airlines. All right. Oh, wow, look at this. This is spectacular. It is, um, I guess this is so the plane can stand up. It's a Turkish Airlines model plane. Uh, I'm sure many of you are looking at this bit next to it first. But it's a Turkish uh, Airlines model airplane. It says Batman v Superman on the side. Oh, that's so awesome. <coughs> There's the stand for it. And then, oh, I wonder, I wonder if anybody got, um, oh, it's Gotham City and Metropolis. Okay, so, oh, you know, I was saying when they released the spots that I, I really wished that, uh, I, I could learn more, even more about the cities. So it's uh, one, one side is Metropolis, and it says what's new, what's on, what's best. Uh, and then it has like all the guides. And then on the other side, Gotham City, of course. And let's see here. <laughs> it's actually chock full of information. That is so exciting. I will be sure to go through this. Look, it has an ad for like Metropolis Taxi. That's so fantastic. I will go through this, uh, you know, over the next couple of days and see if there's anything uh, worth sharing. But this is so cool. Wow. I am so incredibly impressed with the quality of this. The stuff on LexCore. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. This is just uh, such a comprehensive experience. I can't say anything about the movie, and I want to so badly. Ugh, this is a great gift. A, a, a great gift. Okay, I love it. All right, so that's the viewer question of the day. Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, all right, all right, so let's move on to the rest of today's stories, if anything could possibly top that. But we have some very interesting things. Uh, first of all, we're going to do a box office uh, discussion here because so much coverage for Batman v Superman to prepare that uh, I did not have time this week to shoot movie math, but I didn't want to not discuss the box office, so uh, we're going to cover it here uh, as the first story of the day. So Zootopia, as uh, you know, I predicted last week, and I think many people predicted towards the end of last week, uh, it held on to the number one spot. Uh, Allegiant just did not click. It actually came in at about half uh, of the debuts of the first two films. Now, a lot of people are saying it's because they split the movie in half, which I can understand. I think splitting books in half obviously is not working. When you now, I think now you have Mockingjay. Oh, well, Twilight did work though. So here's my feeling on it actually, and I've said this before. I think that the real problem here is Lionsgate's social media policy. Uh, there's a lot of talk about fair use and everything on uh, YouTube these days. I can tell you that Lionsgate is the worst, the absolute worst offender. You cannot cover their movies uh, without them uh, claiming the content and uh, basically, you know, saying that they get all the money off of it. So they've basically shut down any fan discussion of any of their films, and I think you're seeing the result at the box office. And it's not like people have a vendetta against the movies, but that keeps their movies from seeming like events. So. 
something I think for studios to keep in mind as they try to figure out how to you know handle uh, their very complex relationships with uh, the digital media and just fandom in general uh, because you know we're not just talking about you know uh, big channels coverage of this stuff but you know that means that fans can't make fan videos etc uh, so you really just shut down uh, the party so I feel I personally feel that's my theory as to why Allegiant did not do better at the box office I mean who even really knew I mean a number of you when I posted my review were like that came out this weekend so, and also I think that um, the Batman v Superman conversation is strong. And I think that's, I think Daredevil actually, for instance, uh, is gonna get wiped off the map uh, as soon as uh, Batman v Superman starts hitting. And it's opening in foreign countries, I believe actually uh, Wednesday. I think either, well, late tomorrow night. Tuesday night it will hit some countries because uh, those are the, the, the uh, evening showings prior to the release. So I think that as soon as that happens, I think Daredevil is going to be surprised at how quickly the conversation around that show dries up. Uh, I'll have finished it by then, uh, so, I'll, so I, I too will have moved on. <laughs> all right, so uh, that's all very interesting indeed. But I think that hurt Allegiant as well. Uh, then, so that so that came in second. Then Miracles from Heaven, you know, 15 million uh, debut. Uh, you know, its budget was only 13. Pretty standard. It will do very well, you know, for religious films. It'll do very well, obviously. Uh, we're all sure on um, streaming and, you know, in so the ancillary market. Uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane dropped 50%. That's a pretty strong drop. I think that the, I would have hoped that the word of mouth on that would have given it a drop in the 30s. In comparison, Zootopia only dropped 26%. That's shocking. I believe Zootopia, uh, let me check here. I think Zootopia is up to 600 million. Uh, it's almost a 600 million worldwide. That's fantastic. But you remember, it has to get to a billion to do frozen business. Uh, Deadpool, of course, still going incredibly strong. Uh, 8 million. Uh, it is at 730. Oh, it's only about 11 million away from passing The Matrix Reloaded for highest grossing R-rated film of all time worldwide. Some of you are like, what are you talking about, Grace? It already passed it. I'm talking about the worldwide number. Because, you know, when you start making the billion dollar club so important you can't you can't be a fair weather friend or you can't choose different measuring sticks when you have a billion dollar club becomes a huge or the measurement of success and that's a worldwide number you really have to look at the worldwide number overall i get a little annoyed sometimes when uh, the trades will go back to domestic as like uh, record breaking and i'm like no 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 Worldwide. It's a worldwide business sometimes more money comes from overseas now than even from domestic so you got to look at it worldwide uh, then for the rest of the movies, uh, you know, The Perfect Match and Brothers Grimsby both fell almost 60% in their, uh, in their, uh, in their, just their second weekends. <clears throat> and let's see, and so that's, a, that's about it. There wasn't too much activity at the box office, which is one of the reasons I didn't feel too bad about not doing a movie math this week. Uh, of course, the big story is next week. Uh, Midnight Special debuted in five theaters. Uh, that had a very strong uh, per theater average of about 36,000 per theater. That's excellent. That's very good. That's even better than um, uh, <clears throat> My name hello. My name is Doris and I in the sky the Helen Mirren and Sally Field movies We talked about last week. So that's very nice for Warner Brothers and Jeff Nichols. All right Let's move on to the uh, second story of the day And that is the very big headline that Netflix is getting into the blockbuster business and they paid 90 million dollars for bright the uh, the fantasy cop movie from David Ayer and Will Smith and Max Landis, which will also star Joel Edgerton. How did Joel Edgerton get in there? Well, this is a CAA package deal, and he happens to be uh, represented by them as well. So CAA represents everybody involved in this movie, with the exception of Max Landis, who I believe is William Morris Endeavor. But uh, CAA packaged it. They got their guy in there. I think this will seriously help Joel Edgerton's career, unless, of course, he's buried under a mountain of makeup, which might be the case because he's playing an orc. Basically, uh, there's a wand that's that's uh, that needs to be got, uh, taken in by the police. It's you know, it's a weapon that's out there. So Will Smith's human police officer or a detective needs to pair up with an orc uh, detective to get get the job done. It's basically being described as a new fantasy version of Men in Black, uh, which is interesting because the Men in Black franchise, of course, is continuing without Will Smith over at Sony. But now this is a big deal. You know, they've already got Brad Pitt at Netflix with his upcoming film, and now they have Will Smith and David Ayer in an action movie, a, a, a visual effects action movie, hot off of Suicide Squad. But here's the real, to me, the real headline. $90 million, right? It's only a $45 million budget movie, so that means there's $45 million in salaries. And that's not, of course, to everybody associated with the film, that's the top signing talent. <clears throat> for instance, the only uh, salary that was disclosed was Max Landis, $3 million for the script, one of the biggest screenplay deals in recent history. Now, I saw a lot of people complaining about Max Landis getting $3 million, saying, why Max Landis? He doesn't deserve $3 million. If any screenwriter should get paid $3 million, 
pretty low on the list is Max Landis, to which I say, that's not fair. Max Landis wrote this script, got this amazing deal in place. He deserves the money. You get, you make the best deal you can at the time that it presents itself. And Max Landis found himself in a great position, you know, and how nice for him coming off of American Ultra, uh, you know, his, a lot of his frustration lately about his movies not doing well. He wrote Chronicle. Chronicle was excellent. I'm really enjoying his uh, Superman American Alien series. <laughs> from DC, that comic, I think it's excellent, very creative. I like Max Landis. Is he a little bit crazy sometimes? Yes, but I think Max Landis has good ideas. And uh, David Ayer, of course, has rewritten his script a lot, but you know, still Max Landis came up with the idea. And if a big deal is taking place, and you better believe that M Will Smith and David Ayer, I don't know about Joel Edgerton, but David Smith, I mean, um, David Ayer, I've combined them into one entity, but David Ayer and Will Smith, they're getting way more than $3 million. So if that kind of money's going around, Max Landis definitely deserves a good paycheck and his management agent team did a good job making sure that happens so uh but the reason that everyone's getting paid so much up front is that there's no back-end participation in a deal like this because they're going to try go for a theatrical release but then it's going to play on netflix uh and so there is no back-end deal there's no revenue on netflix they do not do you know they don't assign they're they're in the subscription game they want you to subscribe so they want like everyone in the world to pay seven dollars a month or whatever and that gives them quite a lot of money in the bank so they can go make deals like this but that's the name of Netflix's game there you know since so since so since no one's paying to rent bright specifically they can't figure out how much money the movie is making so they can't give anybody any back-end participation which is the norm for a movie like this for instance as we know people like Harrison Ford make 60 million dollars all when all was said and done off of Indiana Jones and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull Robert Downey Jr. made a similar number similar number off of Avengers Back-end deals are a huge part of the business. And I would also remind you that these people aren't getting that full check. Max Landis doesn't get $3 million. Max Landis gets a portion of $3 million. Don't forget he has to pay taxes. Then he has to pay a percentage to his agent, a percentage to his manager, his legal fees. He also, I'm sure, has a publicist. Uh, and so, and then also his business expenses. Screenwriters are self-employed. You know, does he have an office? He has to pay, you know, his rent. Uh, I don't believe Max Landis has a family, uh, you know, at this point. You know, like he's not married and has a uh, kids but you know there are a lot of expenses so you know I'm sure there's a nice takeaway here but let's 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 just remember uh, let's try and put everything in perspective but I think it's a very interesting new dawn on these kind of deals in Hollywood and I'll be curious to see how this affects the business and if it ends up being worth it as an investment for Netflix uh, I think their their movies are getting better all the time uh, as I reviewed I've reviewed Pee-wee over the weekend and I think Pee-wee is their best original film yet it's a little bit like modern performance art as I said uh, <coughs> it's very bold uh, and I'm surprised that Netflix allowed him to do what they did uh, but I think it worked and I think uh, hopefully Netflix reaps some rewards for that so we'll see Netflix is really changing the game but you know sometimes the game doesn't want to be changed so and I'm not just talking about Hollywood I'm talking about audiences they have to show up so we'll see what happens then the third story of the day is a pretty serious story that broke late last week about Dylan O'Brien on the set of the latest Maze Runner movie uh, the death cure uh, he had a very bad accident. So this broke. Uh, there was a lot of um, confusion as to what happened. There were rumors. And they still haven't been cleared up by the studio. But all the studio has admitted is that Dylan O'Brien had a very bad accident on set. He had to be hospitalized. The injuries are not life-threatening, but they're significant enough that the movie had to be shut down and will not resume until he is ready to go back to set, which it seems like will be um, at least a couple of weeks, if not a month or so. Now, these are the two rumors of what happened to him. One is that they were doing a stunt with a car, and that something happened, and that he accidentally got run over by the car. Uh, I, you know, recently this happened to Paz, uh, Paz de la Vega uh, from Boardwalk Empire on like a, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Borders on Porn, those nurse movies that she makes, but she does, you know, um, even though it's not a highbrow movie, her injury was like no, no small matter. And she's actually uh, suing uh, the filmmakers because she uh, had, to, you know, she hasn't been able to work. She's in constant pain. She had to have surgery because basically she was crossing a street for a shot or something and the rear view mirror of like a truck or an ambulance hit her and, uh, you know, caused her serious harm. And then, of course, there's Sarah Jones, uh, the assistant camera person who was killed uh, on the set of Midnight Rider. But so I don't think it's the car because I think that Dylan O'Brien would be even more serious condition than he's in. But this is the action, the other rumor that is very, very serious and that he was uh, sitting on top of a high set and he fell off of it and he fell on his face. That's the other rumor. And so he either fractured his cheekbone 
or his eye, his eye socket. And that's very, very serious. And, you know, especially, you know, for anyone, obviously, but he's an actor. And so you have to wonder, you know, will that alter the way he looks? Uh, I think a, a famous in, or infamous incident of this is Mark Hamill, who really hurt himself, I believe, in a motorcycle accident uh, between A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back. And that's why he looks like a totally different person between the two movies. So <clears throat> it's very serious. Uh, but, you know, Mar Mark Hamill, what happened to him, so tragic, but that happened to him on his own time. Dylan O'Brien, this was when he was putting himself in the safety of the production that he was working on. Why he was not clipped to a harness with a rope, if there was that kind of drop involved, who knows? But clearly, something needs to be done about set safety. You know, we talk about Max Landis in this episode. Of course, his father, John Landis, was uh, the director of a film, that, The Twilight Zone, that had one of the most horrific onset accidents of all time. Really kind of, you know, ruined his career. But he didn't see any uh, jail time, as the director of Midnight Rider has. Uh, and I think that... You know, there's a real gung-ho attitude about movie making, right? Like uh, like battle scars and battle stories about, oh, we got the shot and you know, we weren't supposed to be there, but we pulled it off. And I think that, uh, you know, this is very serious. And I, I'm, it's interesting to see this stuff happening. Uh, I don't know why there's been such a big change. I mean, there have been incidents in the past, but this, it's getting worse. And it might be some of the gung-ho, um, you know, filmmaking that maybe is taking place. You know, in the, stu it's the studio system, everything was very uh, regimented. And, of course, there were huge downsides to the studio system. But you have a lot of, I think, maverick filmmakers entering the picture. Uh, and the stakes are very high. I'm not quite sure what's happening, but I feel very bad for Dylan O'Brien. This is a very serious issue. And I think that set safety, I don't know what it's going to take for Hollywood to take it seriously. So of so Sarah Jones, you know, there was a lot of noise about that for a while, but it went away. And there's been a documentary about it, that, you know, there were uh, people on sets dying because they weren't getting enough sleep and uh, nobody cared about them. And for a while, a lot of noise, but then quietly goes away. And, you know, I think at what point is Hollywood going to realize that they have blood on their hands? So I think that my, what I would say now is that I hope it's very important for everybody to look out for themselves. If Hollywood isn't going to look out for you, I seriously hope that everybody on set, from the top talent, like, you know, that's like above the line. I mean, all talent, obviously, is wonderful. But I'm top talent is the above the line talent, the name talent. And the above the line means on the call sheet. So you're like directors, actors, um, you know, all those people. Uh, they need to look out for themselves all the way down to the below the line talent, like even the PAs. You know, you really have to be like, am I safe? And I hope that the, there isn't still a culture on set of, you know, Dylan O'Brien, don't ask to be harnessed to this set because it's going to make you seem like you're a difficult actor and that you're holding this production up. Well, look what happened to Dylan O'Brien for not insisting on that kind of safety. So that's, I think, the only thing that can be done now. And if hopefully if everybody does it, it's very difficult because if just one or two people break the, break the line, um, it doesn't work for anyone. So that's today's morning movie news. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts down below. Uh, uh, as to what your thoughts are uh, on the top stories of the day uh, and also what you would like to see covered tomorrow and any questions, of course, that uh, you might have. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye.